Hello, tubers. This is Pat Jordan coming to you from the Gravity Ghetto in Illinois. Dearth. Lack. Scarcity. Why is there a scarcity of presence of the flatness of this current sound stage? After all, NASA itself said that the entire universe is flat. Will the universe expand forever? The fate of the universe is determined by the struggle between the momentum of expansion and the pull of gravity. The rate of expansion is expressed by the Hubble constant h sub zero, while the strength of gravity depends on the density and pressure of the matter in the universe. If the pressure of the matter is low, as is the case with most forms of matter of which we know, then the fate of the universe is governed by the density. If the density of the universe is less than the, quote, critical density, which is proportional to the square of the Hubble constant, then the universe will expand forever. If the density of the universe is greater than the, quote, critical density, then gravity will eventually win and the universe will collapse back on itself, the so-called big crunch. However, the results of the WMAP mission and observations of distant supernova have suggested that the expansion of the universe is actually accelerating, which implies that the existence of a form of matter with a strong negative pressure, such as the cosmological constant. This strange form of matter is also sometimes referred to as dark energy. If dark energy, in fact, plays a significant role in the evolution of the universe, then in all likelihood, the universe will continue to expand forever. Infinite universe? The density of the universe also determines its geometry. If the density of the universe exceeds the critical density, then the geometry of space is closed and positively curved like a surface of a sphere. This implies that initial parallel photon paths converge slowly, eventually cross, and return back to their starting point, if the universe lasts long enough. If the density of the universe is less than the critical density, then the geometry of space is open, infinite, and negatively curved like the surface of a saddle. If the density of the universe exactly equals the critical density, then the geometry of the universe is flat like a sheet of paper and infinite in extent. The simplest version of the inflationary theory and extension of the Big Bang theory predicts that the density of the universe is very close to the critical density and that the geometry of the universe is flat like a sheet of paper. Measurements from the WAMP. The WAMP spacecraft can measure the basic parameters of the Big Bang Theory, including the geometry of the universe. If the universe were flat, the brightest microwave background fluctuations, or, quote, spots, would be about one degree across. If the universe were open, the spots would be less than one degree across. If the universe were closed, the brightest spots would be greater than one degree across. Recent measurements, circa 2001, by a number of ground-based and balloon-based experiments, including MAT and TOCO, Boomerang, Maxima, and DASI, have shown that the brightest spots are about one degree across. Thus, the universe was known to be flat to within about 15% accuracy prior to the WAMP results. WAMP has confirmed this results with very high accuracy and precision. We now know, as of 2013, that the universe is flat with only a 0.4% margin of error. This suggests that the universe is infinite in extent. However, since the universe has a finite age, we can only observe a finite volume of the universe. 
All we can truly conclude is that the universe is much larger than the volume we can directly observe. NASA official Dr. Edward W. Wallach, page updated Friday, January 21st, 2014. WAMP means Wilkinson Microwave Anisotropy Probe. I've been posting this link everywhere I go, whether on flat earth sites or when I'm trolling helioglobins. Not a goddamn peep from anyone. Which is strange. You would think for as much activity as I make on vaccine videos and websites and blogs and flat earth videos that I might even get a thumbs up for my postings. I don't know, or frankly, Scarlet, don't give a healthy goddamn whether or not people think that this little revelation from the very tax-stealing collection of amongst the biggest liars and thieves in the history of the universe is significant or not. I fucking do. So I would have expected at least a few thumbs up from the readers or hearts from the channel owners, or that the flat dearth commune titty would pick it up and run with it in the typical fashion that all the other fuck pukes in the medical end of this media do by taking information that I gather, put out there, analyze, and then claim it for themselves. But not a fucking thing. What does that tell us? That most of the flat dearth commune titty is controlled opposition. They either don't get or are afraid of the information because, for me, this little revelation from 2013 makes the Templar pirate Columbo sailing under the threat of the witch Queen Isabella of Spain look like a goddamn kitty birthday party. They started their measurements in 2001, a space oddity, which is the millennium due to the Gregorian I'm a Catholic fucking monk that can't count zero error, which is numerically significant for those lost in the gematria. So now at least you know, NASA, the authority on space, says the entire goddamned universe is flatter than ill annoyed. And that's saying something. The question that I always get when I bring up the topic of a flat dearth is, what difference does it make if it's flat or a globe? What does it matter? A dumb fuck question posed mostly by dumb fucks. Let us deconstruct the dumb fuckery. First and foremost is that if we are indeed imprisoned within Van Allen belts and or a dome, and both directions of egress have their own lethal security system of pleasant welcomes like 120 degrees Fahrenheit below zero in the Antarctic, where the wind chill at those temperatures actually starts to feel warmer, then it is imperative to know if there is an escape off of this fucking rock populated by violent, brain-dead fucking zombies that deserve their fate if they don't even ask where the fucking goddamn exit sign is. There, got that out of my system. Plus, from a physics and science point of view, the unocculting of the shape and status of our environment is critical to the balance of power. Yes, the thumb puppets of the Arcanet are a clear and present danger that serve the AI entity as the trustees in this prison to keep us in line or delete us like bad code if the AI sees fit. But the existential question is deeper. Why are we being imprisoned and farmed in this terrarium? Who or what is in control? How? Do we stop it and take over the entire fucking operation for ourselves? When will this recycling of souls in this shit show end? Because it seems that we really are caught in Dante's divine comedy. That is why it makes a difference between whether the earth 
the earth yaw's wrath is an impossible globe or flat as a buckwheat pancake with blueberries and maple syrup. Control. It makes a difference from the aspect of control. If you don't want to be in control of your life, then you are part of the problem, goddamn zombies. The end goal is to find that goddamn exit sign and get out of the system, even if it meant to brave 120 degrees Fahrenheit below zero just to get away from the brain-dead zombies who don't even care that they are lower than pawns in a game of thrown up. Some say that there is a big-ass hole in the North Pole and that the Earth is hollow. That's actually in keeping with the narrative that the Rosicrucian Dante had in his poem. Dante had an amusing hike down to the center of hell that was frozen over, not a molten iron core. In the modern translation of his work, he and Virgil crawled through an opening in the ice between Satan's legs down to the center of the earth, then had to turn 180 degrees to orient themselves upwards for the climb up and out to Mount Purgatory. Pretty interesting shit for a government bureaucrat from 1300 AD, unless they massage the original text in the modern translation. Me and an Italian little red hen are working on finding if Dante had center of mass gravity physics 192 years before a witch sent a pirate to supposedly sail around the world. There are some that say that Earth is flattish but concave. There are those who say that, like John Lash, that we and the Archons are merely products of a sleeping Gaia Sophia, Mother Earth, who is hallucinating. To which I have said, since I first heard that cockamamie idea was, then wake the bitch up! It really does appear that we are in a controlled environment like a terrarium under study or a Truman Show or a Matrix or some Aeon cunt's hallucination. None of that matters to me beyond where is that fucking exit sign? So with that as a background, then let us get to the point of this video. The Globe Cult relies on several myths to keep the hypnotized pacified. One is that although hydrogen and helium are lighter than air, that the air itself is held in place by gravity. Gravity. An illusion that the master alchemist, Yitzhak Newton, invented to lull the masses. Gravity can somehow hold air masses on a planet that is moving 1,000 miles per hour in rotation and 67,000 miles per hour in revolution orbital speed. I don't really care about how fast it's supposed to be going around the edge of the merry-go-round of the way of milk because with three separate vectors of motion at hypersonic speeds, there is simply no fucking way that you can keep the loose dirt, the free water, and the blanket of air all stuck to an object going fuck freak fast in a goddamn vacuum. That is the point of this video. To demonstrate by scale model in a vacuum that either of these conditions can or cannot exist. If they cannot exist, then the helioglobins are criminally insane cult members. And our mission is to get the fuck off of the sick rock as soon as we possibly can, because it is indeed an asylum for the criminally insane. My first contention begins with the fact of soil liquefaction. There are some of my favorite videos linked in the description on that fact of nature. 
If an object was spinning with loose, dry or wet earth, then the surface would be shed like a Janet Jackson costume failure at the Super Bowl. Talk about your rapture that Faithful and everyone else would be shed into space within the first jerk of the Globetron. My second contention that I, in all scientific inquiry and equanimity, am willing to share to see if it can be proven true or false is that of water staying in place on loose-ass soil on a goddamn flaming beach ball jitterbugging in three force vectors. Here's the thing. Pollock says that there's a fourth phase of water. He demonstrates bridges of water between two beakers with a current applied. Now, the current lie is that there is a molten core of iron that spins and creates a magnetic field for ERF. Problem number one. Magnetism, we have been told, breaks down when iron is flowing. See the links below. Problem number two. Assholes in academia are spinning liquid sodium and generating a magnetic field. Supposedly, I wasn't there. I did not vet their equipment or materials and methods. At this point, I'm not going to believe anyone in this lethal sitcom. Science does change with the input of new data and understanding. That's why it is called science. Otherwise, it would be called religion. But here's the dialectic paradox. How do spinning molten metals generate a magnetic flux when we are told iron at its melting point loses all of its magnetic properties? Problem number three. Supposedly, the only evidence we have for a liquid core is that someone was doing some heavy-duty math calculations on the reverberations of earthquakes and or volcano eruptions and decided it was so. Math is a four-letter word, a religion, a spell-casting abomination that if I were king, I would wipe off the face of the world. Think of it is that the harp array is supposedly able to generate a gigawatt of power that supposedly has the ability to see into the center of the ERF. You know that if that is possible, then they have already done it. But where are the fucking results? Knowledge is power. So if they know what it looks like in the center of the globe or just what is underneath the surface of the pancake, then they're hiding it from us because it would tell us everything and maybe even give directions on that fucking escape route. To continue with my second contention... Whether there was a chewy center surrounded by a candy coating with a light dusting of powdered sugar on top of this spinning confection, the other reality is that 80% of that sugar-coated surface is drizzled with water. It does not require any more experimentation than putting water into a vacuum to know that the shit boils off. Period. There is no more discussion. You can't have a loose-ass ball spinning at hypersonic speeds. Think of the vibrational catastrophes alone. In a goddamn vacuum, and then they say that gravity, that can't even hold down hydrogen and helium, keeps the water in place. Of course, the lame-ass excuse is used that it is like being in a carnival graviton, gravitron, where you are pinned to the back of the wall by the spin. That hoax is destroyed if you put the passengers on the outside of the goddamn ride! Dumbass motherfuckers. See, simple logic and critical thinking will destroy their lives without even needing an experiment. The same is true of the fucking pompous asses who say that it is like traveling in a train where you are moving with the speed of the train and if you drop an object, it falls down because it was under the same acceleration. To which each intelligent flat earther replies, sure, now try the same thing on top of the train. 
So we are stuck with the contention that water can bridge under a dielectric field, but it will break apart at extremely small distances. So what we are required to do in fairness to this question is to find out if there was the influence of a magnetic field that some contend is the stand-in for gravity and that moving water is actually the source of the magnetic field of the Earth. Then we have to find out, can unimaginable masses of water be stuck to a loose-ass powdered sugar on candy that has been shot out of a railgun? That's science! Not the denominational bickering of soy boy Karens protecting their chosen religion. Prove to me, on a scaled-down globe with either an electric charge or an electromagnetic field applied that you can maintain a planar surface of water around that globe at standard temperature and pressure and we will begin to have a rational conversation. We're not even adding in the vacuum at this point. I don't have the time or money to do this kind of work otherwise I would have settled it long ago broken the broom handle off in the ass of the helioglobins and been done with it. The beta test would be to then insert said fictionally successful experiment into a goddamn vacuum chamber to see what was stronger. Vacuum or the most holy and revered gravit fucking tea. And that's just the water. Let us not forget that there is air above it all that never sluices off of the surface uh, well that's not entirely true neither our beloved NASA now says that there is a halo of hydrogen farted out by the ERF that now surrounds the moon and beyond to 378,000 miles Okay, so NASA has been trolling flat Earth sites and my work to know that we don't believe that a vacuum can't suck things off of a hypersonic spinning ball with a fart cloud around it, so they came up with the flatulence field. But when you consider how long they claim that the Earth has had a cohesive atmosphere and that a vacuum would suck every goddamn thing off the surface, including the surface, regardless of the hypersonic speeds, then we should have been hoovered dry like a billion years ago. I will bring up the Keeling curve in just a moment, but let us say that there has been a slow leak in the tire. Let us be generous and say that the ERF has been shedding gases. The question is, in a closed system then, where the hell are the replacements coming from? Easily enough answered, you've got your helium from radioactive decay found in oil fields and such, and anaerobic denitrifying bacteria liberating nitrogen gas for that to be shed also to the upper atmosphere, to infinity and beyond. But at a certain point, the Earth and its materials and its atmosphere should have been shrinking for a long, long time. At about 60 miles up, it is primarily hydrogen, helium, oxygen, and some nitrogen. But that is where the apologetics of the helioglobins break down as well. If the precious gravity was holding the bulk of the atmosphere in place, but it's so weak that it can't even keep its slippery fingers on hydrogen and helium, and those make it to the exosphere and beyond, then just by diffusion alone, this tire has been leaking those gases since they were born. 1989. The Earth is running out of breathable air. This is the warning that was given by Ralph Keeling from Scripps Institute based on data that he started collecting in this year as it was reported in 2010. 
The rate at which the punctured tire is venting is accelerating. His graph called the Keeling Curve shows the trend towards oblivion. In the early years, the oxygen content of the planet was around 30% in 300 million BC, when dragonflies had wingspans four feet across and dinosaurs were as big as office buildings. My third contention, unless an experimental tabletop model of a spinning Earth with an electromagnetic field and loose dirt and water and atmosphere, I'd really like to see how they're going to pull that one off, can be maintained on a globe in a vacuum, then everyone needs to shut the hell up. Modeling is the essence of science. And I'm not talking that math, whore, computer-generated jerk-off modeling that the likes of which they use to predict things like viral spread during pandemics. Plandemics, sorry. I'm talking tennis ball in a vacuum dome sucked down to space-level whore. You don't even have to spin the thing to make me happy. I did some math. Despite the tens of thousands of miles of circumference of the Earth and its 1,000 mile per hour spin, it rotates only once in 24 hours. So unless I can be proven wrong, then in a tabletop model, with the glob of mud in a vacuum chamber with an axle hooked to a hand drill, the RPMs, revolutions per minute, would be painfully negligible to the point of dismissing them from the experiment. As noted for the orbital velocity that has been likened to a tilt-a-whirl carnival ride, that would add too much difficulty to something that's prime purpose is to prove if loose mud, water, and atmosphere can stick to the surface of a globe. No point in making the other side go through difficult gyrations since any idiot already knows that answer and what comes next. The initial experiments and models can be anything because science refines over time. I don't care if it's a mud ball covering a spherical electromagnet capable of at least 600 volts. At this point, I'm probably obligated to give a warning that only qualified experimenters should try this so they don't get injured or killed, or any reasonable value above that if it can be demonstrated that whatever this planet is can generate an electrostatic field of whatever magnitude. Video proof is required with detailed notes on materials and methods because science also dictates that all experiments have to be replicable. The most creative part will be to demonstrate how water will conform to and adhere to a globe before the vacuum is switched on. But the godlike feat will be to somehow affix an atmosphere to the thin layer above said magnetized globe that also conforms to the entire shape of the globe before the vacuum is switched on. In all fairness, because all of these requirements are impossible feats, I would even allow for heavier-than-air gases to be used, including in their plasma state, if it was possible to surround the globe with them before turning the vacuum on. Given that Earth's atmosphere is an exotic mix of elements, including noble gases, that are heavier than, quote, air. This is not a request, but a demand. Until this model has been tested and demonstrated as possible and confirmed by third parties, then just shut the fuck up about a goddamn globe because you are just a psychotic, sick cult.